Hey, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the virtual workshop uh, from Insight to Action, moving, like, moving yeah, forward with library advocacy in South and African countries. Before we dive in further, I would I love to I would love to invite uh, Madam Sarah, uh, Dr. Sarah Kadu, the chair of the region, to give us uh, an opening remarks. Over to you, Dr. Sarah. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's workshop um, on the theme from insights to action, moving forward with library advocacy in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, the objectives of this workshop are to provide participants with a clear understanding of the approaches and strategies from library advocacy perspective. Um, to help participants understand stakeholder mapping and engagement strategies that can be used to build relationship with key decision makers. Uh, three, to help participants to understand how voluntary national review process works and the tools to collect stories to report library impact for sustainable development. Uh, five, uh, to interest sub Southern Africa Region Division Committee members to take on mentorship role and to give an opportunity to countries that never participated in the survey to join this conversation. And lastly, but not least, to share experiences relating to advocacy and SDGs and voluntary national reviews from experienced colleagues on this platform. Our colleagues also, I'd like to share with you that uh, the original plan was to have the call the in-country co-design team participated at this workshop, but the scope was widened because we realized uh, the importance of this workshop and hence we, we opened it up to everyone who has interest. We kept on receiving emails requesting to be part of this meeting. And so we've widened the scope. Um, we are going to focus on um, majorly four areas. Um, throughout this meeting, we are going to uh, look at advocating for libraries, strategies and approaches, and also we are going to look at stakeholder mapping and engagement, building relationships for libraries. We shall also look at the voluntary national reviews and how to report library impact for sustainable development. And of course, uh, what is very interesting, our uh, hearing or receiving experiences from colleagues who have gone through this already. Uh, so colleagues, without much further ado, I would like to hand over to the next uh, colleague to take us through. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sarah, for that detailed and comprehensive introduction uh, to today's session. So um, we're gonna proceed now to give us a brief insight into what our speakers are today and what we expect to hear from our speakers. So we have two, three sessions today, basically. And our first speaker is Stephen Wiper, who's the Director for Policy and Advocacy at IFLA. We'll be speaking about advocating for libraries, strategies and approaches, and building relationship for libraries. And afterwards, we're going to have uh, Christine. Uh, Christine is a member, a member officer at IFLA, and she'll be working us through reporting library impacts for sustainable development, develop, development, case study examples from the SDG story of the IFLA library map. And then we proceed down to the experience sharing session afterwards. So at this point, I'm going to hand over to Stevie. But before then, uh, we know you're going to have questions you want to ask. So after all the sessions, we're going to take your questions and comments and contributions also. So at this point, I'm going to hand over to Stephen Weber. Over to you, Stephen. Thank you very much indeed. So thank you, General Lowe. Thank you, Sarah, for organising this session. And it, it, it's always good to know when more people want to turn up to things than are expected and are, and are banging on the doors trying to get in. So hopefully we'll, we'll make this as, as, as useful and interesting as possible. Um, I will cover a reasonable bit of ground in one session. Obviously, we'll share the slides, but I think really I'm, I'm, I'm trying with this to give an overview, hopefully to set some of the scene. Um, and then it will be Damalari and Sarah who really lead you into the, the, some of those good practicalities of what it is that this means in terms of the first steps you should take. So um, as I said, I'm focusing broadly on 
advocating for libraries and in particular I've tried to break it down in, into some of those sort of key questions around why, what, where, when, who and how of advocacy. Um, I said I'll share the slides but hopefully it's going to be helpful for you. Um, so I suppose it, it's always good discipline with these things to start by actually thinking about defining uh, terms and, and defining what, what, what it is that we're actually trying to do. To give a quick sense, and we will come back to this throughout the session, what is advocacy? What do we understand it as being about? And I think that the best way of thinking about it is thinking about well, what is it trying to achieve? Advocacy is something, it's not a sport that you carry out for, for its own sake, and it's there for a purpose. Crucially, it's there to influence decisions that are made about libraries. So it's that full a spectrum of activities, that full range of activities that get you to this point, that shape decisions that are made about something that we care about. So why we advocate, the first question, so it was good to start with the existential ones. And crucially, it's because libraries do depend on decisions. Um, we don't, for the most part, for, for, to a large extent, we don't necessarily ask for money. We don't charge her entry into, into the library on, for the most part. Um, we are dependent on support from a central agency. Um, we are dependent on support potentially from local governments or, or that, that, that allow us to function. We are dependent on university authorities. We're dependent on culture ministries. And, and, and we do this because, I don't know, we get this support and this is what allows us to actually be universal. But of course, if we want decisions that favour us, and in particular, if we want these people to spend money on libraries and not on another policy area, not on another type of service, we need to make sure that they support us, that they see our value, that they see working with libraries and as uh, working with libraries as an investment and not as a cost. Um, so that, you know, that, that that's why, because yeah, I said we depend on others. If we want to be universal, if we want to be fee free as far as possible, as far as possible, we need to make sure that others are ready, they stand up and they see the value of supporting us. And that, of course, takes advocacy. In terms of then what we advocate about, again, I want this. I think this is something that we should think about in terms of it's the outcomes. And so what we need to be able to do is think, have that image in our head. Of what does success look like? And we all want to be able to, to say, well, you know, what does a great library service, what does a transformational library service look like for the people we serve, the communities we serve, be it a local community, a university community, the community made up of people within a government department, within a parliament. What does that great library service look like? And then we need to work backwards from there. What are the decisions that need to be made? What are the transformations that need to be made? in order to get us to this point. And some of you may be aware of the concept of a, a theory of change. It's that series of decisions that are needed. And those individual points, those individual issues, they're going to be the things we want to advocate about, the change that's needed in order to get us to where we want to be. Where do we advocate? Um, and I think crucially for that, I think we need to sit back and we need to think, and, and this is what you'll do with some of your mapping work and your stakeholder mapping work in particular, where are decisions made? Now, there's a very obvious, there's some very obvious answers. So a lot of decisions are, are taken in, in national governments, in parliaments, in local councils, in university senates, on the boards of funding agencies, etc. But I'd encourage you with this, be a little, I don't know, be creative with your thinking, be creative with your planning, because clearly, okay, the final decision is they are taken there, but maybe decisions are taken beforehand. Maybe there's a planning meeting, a planning session, a subcommittee that's actually taking decisions about the issues you care about. Maybe the votes, the positions taken by people in a parliament, in a Senate, in wherever else, these are actually shaped by influences beforehand that when a member of parliament, when a senior university administrator goes to the meeting, they've already made up their mind. And so we also need to think about where do people make up their minds? What influences, what shapes them? I think this is, I don't know, so, and, and 
we'll talk a little bit about more of this later, but I did want to make a small digression at this point that I think I come across a lot, that when we're thinking about where we go, and I guess within that, who are the people we're trying to influence? Who are the people whose opinions we're trying to shape? We need to be careful to think about making arguments in, in terms that work for them, in terms that are logical. I know there's often a tendency amongst libraries, but to be honest, among any stakeholder group out there, that we simply, we believe we have a divine right to be there, that, that libraries are the answer to everything. We find it difficult to understand why some people might not value libraries, why some people may not be already converted to the idea that libraries are the answer to everything. And then our advocacy often doesn't work because we're trying to make arguments based on an assumption that other people don't share. So what we actually need to do in our arguments and in approaching people in those different spaces with those different interests, with those concerns, is to place those concerns and interests first. We need to make sure that we show that libraries are the answer to the questions that decision makers and those who influence them are asking. And so, for example, an education minister probably doesn't, I don't know, an education minister may not care automatically about libraries. However, they do care about literacy. They do care about media and information literacy. They do care about whether children have access, whether children are able to develop research skills, whether researchers are able to develop research skills. And so it's very important to think about how, when we advocate in different places, at different stages of processes, what are, the, what are the concerns? What are the issues that we want people to bear in mind? So coming back to the, the, the W questions that we had down, when do we advocate? Um, potentially all the time. Um, I think there's an argument and, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about this shortly. I would argue that doing a good job and showing it is uh, it's an act of advocacy. It's showing the value, it's showing the importance of libraries. Decision makers are only ever going to want to support sectors, are only going to want to support people who can show that they're doing a good job, that they're committed, that they're engaged, that they have a sense of mission. So to some extent, in all that we do, we are advocating or we're providing evidence, even if we're not shouting it, we're showing that we do a good job. But I think crucially, and this is very much attached to the where question, it's also useful to be able to think about when are decisions taken? What is the, the, the process that's in place? You'll talk a little bit about voluntary national reviews, but for example, a voluntary national review, it is presented in July of any given year. And so we'll have voluntary national reviews, for example, from Rwanda, from Tanzania, from Burkina Faso, that will be presented in July. But that means that actually the worst possible time to advocate probably July, because all of the decisions have been taken by that point. Actually, the right time to start advocating will be in the last half of the previous year. It will be to when the people who are planning this work, when they start, when they hold stakeholder events, when they hold consultations, it's being able to get in then. Because also, the people you're advocating to will appreciate that you're following the process that you're making use of the possibilities that are already there. Of course, you can go further. Don't feel like you have to stick to only the formal processes, but you can't expect to go in and get a special ticket to the party. You need to show that you're following the process, you're playing the game, and you want a little bit more. Um, who advocates? Um, again, broadly, every librarian can be an advocate. And, and I think it's worth just repeating that point. Anyone who's doing a good job and showing it is an advocate. You're helping to convince your colleagues, you're helping to convince the people you serve, students, faculty, staff, um, teachers, citizens in general, uh, parliamentarians, um, government officials. When you're doing a good job, you're showing them that you're worthwhile, that we are worth supporting, that we are a great investment. So every librarian can be an advocate. And um, we'll talk a little bit about how different skill sets and how different abilities feed into this. Some of these things will be, be similar to, to the work that you've already done around looking at different elements of advocacy. But I'd also suggest, and this is something you'll talk about when looking at stakeholders, that 
it doesn't necessarily just need to be librarians who advocate for libraries. And I think this is also powerful. Um, this risks sounding a little bit cynical, but a librarian who stands up and says that libraries are great, of course, that's good, but it's not much of a surprise. What's really interesting is when we can find champions in other sectors, people who can stand up and say, well, I'm not a librarian, but I, I understand. I, I get why libraries are so important. I get why we need to support libraries in order to improve our societies, in order to make things happen. And so looking at potential allies, users of the library, you can gather testimonials, you can gather examples, like-minded groups. Teachers should be in favour of libraries. Researchers should be in favour of libraries. Other organisations that value knowledge, media literacy organisations, they should be friends of libraries. What about journalists, influencers, politicians as well? We can hopefully look to find champions, people who will do our work for us, will complement the work that we need to do on advocacy, will be really strong voices. So that's, that's the who. Um, but as I said, we'll talk a little bit about, more about who in the library sector advocates. And I think this is the, the, the big chunk, but I, don't know, I think it'll take about five minutes to get through of how we advocate. And I know you'll talk a lot more about this, so there's just some really high level ideas. I think a quick question, because I'm conscious I haven't made this at all interactive so far. Um, I've suggested that advocacy involves a whole spectrum, a whole range of potential activities, a whole range of of the things that you can do in order to support advocacy goals. So at this stage, what I'd like you to do is um, say in the chat, which of these activities, if any, doesn't have anything to do with advocacy? So do use the chat function, write down A, B, C, D, or none, and then let's see how you get on. So I'll give you 30 seconds for this. So please do use the chat function and I'll be looking at it as we go. So I don't know if you can find it. It should just have flashed up. Thank you. A lot of you are getting the heavy hint I made at the end. That's good. <laughs> Another 10 seconds. Excellent. So all, all, all of you who have said none, which is effectively all of you, um, <clears throat> you're, you're absolutely right. These are all elements of advocacy. Um, there's often the story that people see advocacy as being the same thing as lobbying. Um, and I, I would argue that yes, it is, <clears throat> at lobbying is part of advocacy. I think lobbying is far narrower. Lobbying is very much the end product. It's something that you can do, but it's empowered by advocacy. It's important to do, to have those personal relationships, to know the minister's children's names and grandchildren's names and so on. But it's absolutely not the full picture. And of course, what this actually does is means that there's a role for lots of us in there and it's totally normal that so many of us, we won't feel comfortable trying to be a lobbyist, wandering around government departments and talking to people and getting selfies with them and so on. That's important, but we don't all need to do that. We all have a role. Um, and we can think of it, uh, I mean, this, uh, this is slightly more game-like and we'll get to the link to it. W we would argue that, I don't know, whether you are a grassroots activist, someone who's more comfortable talking to people in your community, a good public speaker who can stand up at a meeting, and make a point clearly, a legal expert who can understand laws and processes, a writer, a designer, a social media expert, a coordinator to pull ideas together, an intelligence gatherer, someone who's great at looking for stories, at gathering stories, and, uh, who's, great for, who's great at looking out at processes, at spotting opportunities, evidence gatherer, someone who can collect stories, can spot opportunities and lobbyists. There's a role for all of them. And I suspect that all of you will, fall into that. So I will share this link in the chat shortly, um, but do have a look at this. We have actually done a bit of a quiz 
um, working with OCLC um, on different types of advocacy personalities. So you can look at that link and, and you will get a sense of, you'll be able to get an idea of, given what you feel comfortable with, given what you feel safe and strongest doing, one of these different library advocacy personality types will work for you. Um, and then this is the final section, and this really comes on to the how aspect. We also argue, and you've probably filled in the survey that very much points in this direction, advocacy doesn't just take different personalities, it takes those different activities. And we can crunch this down into eight types of activity, understanding the landscape, coordinating your work, so understanding the landscape, knowing what these processes are, where decisions are taken, coordination obviously so we're using resources in the right way mobilizing really taking advantage of the fact that we are a feel we do exist in pretty well every town but across in pretty well every region there will be a library there'll be a librarian we have a strong legitimacy because we are across our countries about gathering evidence about communication being effective in public communication building relations with the decision makers that, ad, that lobbying side of things advocacy partnerships, finding champions, finding like-minded groups, and then of course being able to plan, to set objectives and to evaluate where they are. And so a second thing, a second document, which I'll include a link to, is our advocacy capacities grid. This is there as a tool, a material that you can use. The idea is that you can look down the, 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 row, the rows, the to row, to row titles on the left, and then by looking at the descriptions, you can work out whether you think you're more of a starter, whether you're intermediate, whether you're very, whether you're quite advanced, whether you're very advanced. And the idea of this is then is to give you a sense of, well, where might you want to focus your efforts a little bit more? Where could it be helpful to actually look to, where could it be helpful for you to focus efforts? And I think this is actually, it's an interesting exercise to carry out individually, but I think especially working as a group, it's a really interesting exercise because then you can work well, who do you need to recruit? What skills do you need to develop? Where might you want to actually focus your time? So a lot of this is up on our website under ifla.org advocating for support. Again, I'll share this link in the chat very shortly. Hopefully that will be helpful for you. But I also wanted to avoid speaking for too long so that um, we don't, uh, so that I don't take away time from workshopping. So thank you very much. Um, please do put questions in the chat and I'm very happy to hand back to Gamalare. Yeah, thank you so much, Stephen, for that very concise uh, presentation and insight into library advocacy. And and our, our participants, we, we are aware you have questions you want to ask. Uh, please uh, have them ready and drop them in the chat box. We're going to give you the chance to ask those questions as we progress uh, in today's uh, discussion. But now we're going to dive into the next session, which is going to be alert by Christine, uh, where she'll be speaking about reporting library impact for sustainable development, uh, case study examples of the SDG story on the eFlower library map. Christine, over to you. Thank you, Damilari. Thank you for inviting me. So let me just try and share my screen. Yeah, well, you should be able to see now. Well, first I was to say that um, no, I was invited to talk about the, the library impact, and this is uh, only 20 minutes, and, and it's, it was really hard for me to choose <laughs> what exactly to tell you, because uh, honestly, I can talk about the impact for hours, but today I decided to focus on, on mainly uh, two things, or or what Stephen already started to, to talk about, how, uh, how do we advocate, and, and a little bit about how we can present that uh, impact. So the, the full title of the presentation is, is uh, reporting library impact for sustainable development uh, uh, based on examples of the SDG stories from the library map of the world. And that's why uh, I'd like to start with, uh, with just uh, saying that the library map of the world today is you know, containing three types of contents. Uh, the SDG stories that I'll be focusing today, uh, it also has uh, library statistics, as you know, and full country profiles. 
And just to mention, as you will be talking later also about the VNR processes, and uh, uh, I must just uh, say that the, the country profile on the library map can also be a useful tool if you want to raise uh, awareness about the, the library field in your country among your stakeholders. So that would be another thing to, uh, to maybe consider for future. So if you go online, you will uh, find uh, 140 countries now with uh, library statistics. Uh, some has more, some has less, uh, 30 countries with full country profiles and 57 stories. Uh, six out of those 57 stories are uh, coming from Sub-Saharan Africa region. And I will be talking a little bit about those uh, examples uh, just uh, in a minute. So what are the stories? Uh, if you haven't looked at the map, I invite you to really go online, uh, librarymap.ifo.org slash stories, and uh, you will find all of them there. And uh, these are stories about impactful uh, library programs contributing to achievement of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And I want to say that the focus here is on word impactful. And uh, yeah, we'll talk about what that impactful actually uh, means. Uh, so, but first, <clears throat> thinking about, you know, making sure that our stakeholders understand the impact that we are making and particularly uh, impact on sustainable development and the value of uh, our libraries on communities in general. Uh, this is one of the 10 uh, opportunities from the global vision where we all agreed, and it's still relevant after all this time, uh, that uh, we need to ensure stakeholders understand the value and impact. But when I think about how how we advocate. I think that sometimes <laughs> this picture represents it very well. So that is how we are bombarding our stakeholders with different types of information, with different type of data. And uh, sometimes it may be, be too much or too little, but in many times is a different type of information that uh, our stakeholders would want to see. Uh, and I want to recommend that there is a a change of mindset or change of thinking uh, required when it uh, comes to how we tell our stories to our stakeholders so that they really um, uh, hear what we want to say. And, and uh, Stephen mentioned the theory of change. So the logic model uh, is, uh, is a practical tool of the theory of change that will start with the needs and uh, eventually will lead to some outputs and outcomes and uh, greater impact. So there is a promise in the logical model because everything, every input will lead to impact. But I want to propose uh, uh, looking at the logic model also as a tool that can help you focus on what's important to stakeholders. And I can tell that this really helped me uh, myself also to communicate better uh, about the impact, uh, especially when you have time constraints and very little time you can leave out uh, unnecessary detail. And this is the same logic model, but put in the in the wheel uh, that uh, starts with the needs or the problem, uh, goes through inputs, some activities, and then leads to outputs, outcomes, and impact. And you'll see that the stakeholder perspective is really... Uh, different from a, a library or librarian's perspective. And what is hard for us as librarians sometimes when we do advocacy work is to, uh, is to move away from that library perspective and to, to take that different stakeholder perspective. And I want to give you just some examples of, uh, of how this would work in practice. Uh, when it comes to advocacy. And just, this is just an example where I'd say that the need is an employment or the problem is unemployment in some community. Uh, so what we need are some resources. We will dedicate staff, equipment, money to do some job skills training. And we will train a certain number of people which will be the output of our activity, right? But then the outcome, what we want to focus on will be people, number of people uh, who improved skills and who might uh, have found job because of that training. And when it comes to presenting all this at the stakeholder perspective, we will use this outcome uh, and translate it 
into a story about reduced unemployment rates and uh, things that matter from a stakeholder perspective, for example, a minister. Or another example, and this is uh, this logic model or theory of change uh, is in fact uh, based on a, a, an actual project from Ghana, uh, uh, the mobile libraries project. And the problem or the, the need uh, was that there was a lack of ICTs in school and, be, and children who needed to pass the, the, the exam on, on computer or ICT usage, they failed exams because they didn't have computers to learn it. So what the library did, so they the project was about creating this mobile library van, uh, investing in some equipment, uh, content and stuff. And they visited the schools, uh, provided hands-on training, and uh, and this can be measured, of course, in the number of visits or number of trained uh, children. But when it comes to advocating about uh, the value and the impact that we made or the contribution that we made on the access to ICTs in that uh, community, we need to talk about improved skills or enhanced learning, uh, and uh, translating to boarding that includes enabled use development that was a community's uh, or stakeholders uh, main goal. <laughs> let's uh, let's put it that way. So that is just and like I hope this can be also useful for you, but for me, it was a really a useful thing to change that perspective and really clarifies uh, different types of data and what we mean by impact. Uh, because the stakeholders' perspective is that uh, impact that we want to uh, impact story uh, that we want to tell tell to them. So the next time when we need to ensure that our stakeholders understand the value and impact, it might just uh, involve you know change of the vocabulary, uh, just uh, talking about the same things but in a different uh, different language. So that's why we really need to focus on communities and outcomes for people when it comes to stories and that is what we do for SDG stories for the library map. Uh, what you see on the screen now is, uh, is a screenshot of our storytelling flowchart uh, that explains uh, like the logic or the model that we use for our stories, uh, which uh, we believe is very powerful. Uh, and it also helps us to better, um, you know, demonstrate the, the contribution that we are making on sustainable development. Because in the first place, we will talk about the problem, about the context, uh, we'll talk about why we are doing certain activities, provide certain services uh, to help our communities so that uh, we can understand the context better. And this why part is also the part uh, where we want to make sure that we use the language that is relevant uh, to certain SDGs or SDG targets. So the middle part about what will come just naturally, because we'll tell what we did to help the situation. And that's where, that is where we are like most comfortable talking about our activities, our projects, but it's not the main thing of the story. The, the main part of the story is to talk about the impact, about the outcomes and the change for people uh, that participated uh, in our activities. And that is the part, so what, so what happened after your project finished, uh, how this has helped uh, improve people's lives. And yeah, there are then you can use different survey data or just testimonials and feedback, uh, anecdotal evidence uh, to back up uh, your story uh, with that uh, impact evidence. So all of this is uh, described in, in bigger detail, detail in our storytelling manual. And I'll post the links uh, in the chat after I finish the presentation. So the manual consists of uh, four main chapters, but I really invite you to just explore more in detail the, the elements uh, of this, uh, what we call evidence-based uh, storytelling and what impact means and how, uh, how to really incorporate it uh, in uh, the story. Uh, the other um, chapters are all that are relevant also for the digital storytelling, but how to tell your story will be one that explains in bigger detail what I just uh, presented. So that's uh, about the framework, but then I want to um, talk about this other thing, 
that when it comes to storytelling, uh, everybody would agree that it's important that we adapt our story uh, to our target audience. And uh, so it's important that we use the, the target audience vocabulary. Uh, but uh, in the context of uh, presenting impact or telling stories for uh, presenting um, contribution to sustainable development, uh, it has another meaning because all the SDGs, they have targets and each of those targets have certain number of indicators that are used to measure all of this. And I find that uh, focusing on, on targets is uh, really helpful and can be a first uh, entry point on understanding how to better present the impact and the contribution that you're making on sustainable development. And here I want to mention, and, uh, and some of you might know about this resource, but uh, years ago, IFLA uh, produced this uh, one sheet uh, infographic uh, called Information for Development, uh, Why Access Matters Across the SDGs. And uh, what it does is that it lists uh, not the goals anymore, but the targets under these goals, uh, which are mostly uh, relevant uh, to library field and to li library activities. Uh, and these are also the targets that are used in the SDG stories uh, uh, on the map. So on the infographic, you will find that some of the, the, the wording is bolded out. And these are those focus areas that are relevant to the work of the library, such as access to services, access uh, to information and uh, communication technologies, access to skills, uh, different skills development, awareness raising uh, about the climate change, about many different other things. And uh, this is uh, something that I want to recommend that you take a look on uh, to see, uh, because it can really help you uh, focus uh, your advocacy activities, but also your uh, your library activities and better understand how they are relevant uh, to the sustainable development goals. Uh, to finish a little bit about the impact, another thing that I want to mention is that, that when you will think about presenting that impact, uh, it is important to know that um, there is a logic behind uh, of how how impact is structured or outcomes uh, uh, and how change happens because some things will take a shorter amount of time and some things will take a longer time. And some of you might think that uh, you need to wait for years to make evaluation of your activities and uh, get gather some evidence. But there are things that uh, will, will take uh, a little time. And this is a powerful already evidence if you can collect uh, some data on the activities that you do. And the first thing that you will also find in the SDGs framework and that infographic mentioned frequently is awareness. And awareness is something that you can achieve uh, in a fairly short amount of time. You make a, a, a workshop, let's say, uh, for a community to talk about recycling and uh, just by participating in that event, uh, if they did, did know little before, they will know more afterwards. So they will receive some knowledge uh, and then the skills development uh, will take a longer time. And it's also good to, you know, follow up uh, with your target audiences uh, in, in some amount of time to see if they, they use your, their skills and how this can change. Changing attitudes uh, is also possible, uh, but can take a longer period of time. And then, of course, if we changed our attitude, then we can change our behavior. Let's say I changed my attitude towards recycling uh, plastic bottles, let's say. And uh, I, I started to think that it really is uh, important and uh, useful thing to do. And I start to change my behavior and recycle more frequently. And all of this will eventually lead uh, to a quality of life with this by showing this i just wanted to encourage you uh, to think about uh, big impacts such as awareness that you can uh, collect uh, an evidence already now so and to finish my short presentation i would like to just uh, invite you to look at the stories that we have on the map and uh, really to try to uh, read carefully uh, and um, uh, 
to observe how other libraries, other institutions, uh, they presented uh, the impact uh, of their libraries on the sustainable development. And I want to mention and just walk you through the six uh, uh, libraries, the six SDG stories from, from Sub-Saharan Africa region. And the uh, first of them is from Ghana. Uh, that's about the project or well, providing access to sexual and reproductive health education um, in the libraries. And they had a specific target group of teenagers. And this is very interesting and powerful um, outcome that they have reached because they, in fact, changed their attitudes. Uh, in the story, you will find that there is a testimonial from a member of parliament uh, who said that uh, that he never thought that libraries can also provide support in this uh, area because previously his thought is just about reading. But uh, in the end, he stated that uh, the issue uh, is of concern and if libraries want to help, that the uh, that they will also support the initiative. So in fact, they, they changed uh, the policymakers' uh, perspective or the attitude uh, towards libraries. So the, then we have two stories from Kenya. Uh, one is uh, is from Kibera, and uh, it's a really powerful story because the library is uh, is uh, located uh, in uh, in an informal settlement, and uh, the project is about uh, education and providing access, uh, you know, to education services for children. Uh, uh, in Kibera, and uh, a project was called uh, uh, Kids on the Tab. Uh, and what happened is the problem was that the children in, from Kibera they were they they never gained admission to provincial provincial or national schools uh, before the project. But after project, there was almost thirty percent of children. Uh, who improved the skills and they were admitted uh, to the national schools. And this is uh, a huge uh, contribution to the education uh, in, in Kenya. So the other project uh, comes from Nakuru uh, Library in Kenya, a math based project. And I also invite you to, to look into this. Uh, this was about uh, providing support in, in learning science and mathematics uh, in uh, in Kenya, and uh, and here again, uh, the measurement was done to compare the situation before, what was the problem, and what was afterwards. That uh, really the the scores of uh, children who uh, uh, achieved good grades in mathematics improved because of participating in this project. Uh, in Nigeria, the project was about access to electricity, which is in, very unstable in this country. Uh, and the library came up with, uh, with providing 24-7 uh, uh, reading room, uh, which provided electricity and resources and access to technology to students who otherwise would not have it. And two projects from South Africa. Uh, one is... Uh, related to the SDG number eight, uh, a library-led community garden where people, you know, build skills how to grow their own food and uh, and uh, use it uh, in their own benefit. And another uh, project uh, where library provided uh, rural farmers uh, and really small uh, small uh, farmers uh, with ICT skills and uh, in access to information. And at the end of the day, uh, they reported that they were able to double their crop because of the access and skills that they access to information and skills they received in the library. And uh, it is curiously enough that there is uh, a very specific indicator uh, or target that talks exactly about this uh, doubling the pro productivity and incomes for uh, small scale uh, food producers. So I invite you to just uh, go online, look at yourself. And at the end, I want to mention that uh, we also, apart from the stories on the map, we do have uh, a YouTube playlist. And I'll share the link in the chat. Uh, also, this contains short videos about the stories that we have on the map. And even if they are not coming from your region or from your country, they might be useful resources to some, to some including the advocacy presentations or any other materials where you can in, in, include the audiovisual material. They're very short, uh, up to uh, one minute long, and um, and highlight the impact uh, that libraries are making 
uh, on the SDGs. So that was all that I was able to prepare and tell you in those 20 minutes. I hope something uh, was uh, useful for you and gave uh, some ideas on how you can go about uh, increasing the number of stories uh, for Sub-Saharan Africa region on the library map. We do have this requirement to really focus on impact and we call them impactful stories, uh, but every story is a learning experience and uh, I invite you to to look at your own projects to see uh, if you have evidence and uh, would be interested also to have your stories on the map and work together to, to present uh, the impact that you're making on sustainable developments in sub-Saharan sub Africa. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Christine, for this insightful presentation. And this is very constructive, uh, sharing key insights around uh, documenting library impact and showcasing these stories and the impact libraries are making in every society. And I totally enjoyed the examples you displayed, which are very, very practical examples that can be replicated in various countries. So now we're going to dive into the next part of today's session, uh, which is experience sharing. Uh, during this process, we're gonna hear from our senior colleagues here to, to share with us their experience engaging advocacy for libraries, more around the SDGs and Vienna process and also COC advocacy, advocacy contest uh, in African countries. At this point, I'm going to invite uh, to speak, uh, Dr. Victoria Okoje, uh, to share with us our experience on advocacy in African countries and also other can further guide the in country advocacy co design team present in this particular workshop. Dr. Okoje, over to you, ma'am. Um, thank you very much, Dam Larry. And uh, thank you, Madam Chair of Africa, uh, Sub Saharan Africa Regional Division, for the opportunity to share my experiences on advocacy on libraries and the SDGs. Uh, specifically, um, I want to share my experience on library engagement in voluntary national reviews in Nigeria. Um, since I have only 10 minutes to speak, I would like to um, pass on three key messages as our takeaway for today. First, IFLA has organized a lot of capacity building programs on libraries and the SDGs over the years. At the regional level, we certainly um, had a workshop for presidents of African Library Associations in Pretoria in South Africa. Uh, we've had sub-regional workshops in West Africa, East Africa, Southern Africa. We've also had national workshops and at the local level, we have also had workshops. So there is a lot of materials that are available on the IFLA website. And I would encourage all of us to look at the IFLA website to get um, some of these materials. Some of them Stephen have shared, uh, has shared, and some uh, have been shared by Christine. There is a lot more that you can find on the IFLA website, and I encourage you to go there. If you have difficulty in accessing the resources, uh, you can either contact IFLA or contact me. So that's my first takeaway for today. The second thing I want to talk about today um, has already in part been mentioned by Stephen, the theory of change advocacy capacities. And um, Christine also talked about logic model. And so some of the key elements in these models um, I would just mention because they are important ingredients when you're doing advocacy. The first thing that I would talk about is the fact that when you're doing advocacy, you must plan. You must have done some research on who 
your advocacy target is, what their interests are. Um, Stephen talked about knowing the names of your ministers and so on and so forth. Advocacy is not something that you do in a haphazard manner. Um, for instance, you should understand the culture of the community if you want to advocate to a community chief. In my culture, for, in, for example, if you want to visit a community chief, you must go with a gift. That's the culture. Your gift is not a bribe, it's just the culture. So you need to understand some of these um, cultural dimensions if you want to have a successful advocacy. And when I say a gift, it doesn't necessarily mean something that is expensive or big. It could just be a bottle of whiskey. Our chiefs love whiskey. So do some research and find out how do you get the attention of the people that you want to advocate to. Something else that you need to do is to be prepared. Just like the boss, Boy Scout say, be prepared. Because as a library advocate, you should be prepared to discuss library issues at all times. You do not know when you're going to meet the policymaker, the minister of yes, education sir. or culture. You, you are not sure when you would meet the person who can drive that change that you desire to make. And so in the IFLA workshops that I said we have organized, uh, we usually practice how you can become an expert in giving an elevator pitch. This is the kind of discussion that you have with a high level policymaker or a community uh, chief or so, uh, or any of the stakeholders that you want to advocate to, and who has a maximum of just about one minute to listen to you. So how would you captivate their attention in order to get an appointment for a more detailed discussion? That means that you must do your research and understand the key issues in the LIS sector that you can advocate for. When you meet the policymaker, that is not the time when you start trying to decide on what to talk about. It is something that you already know, something that you have already prepared. And like I said, you know, something for that you can say within one minute that can attract uh, the attention of the policymaker to give you an appointment. This is very important. The third thing I think you need to do is to make your message very simple and clear. Communication is key, is very important. And um, I think like Stephen and Christine already said, you must use the principle of the what, the why, who, when, where, how, what is it you want? Is it that you want more libraries in schools? Why do you want more libraries in schools? Who will benefit? How would you do it? How do you ad uh, would you advise that the policymaker should go about putting more libraries in schools within the budgets, the very limited budget that they have? Like I said, um, Stephen talks about the the what, who, why where and how, and Christine also. So I'm not going to 
um, deal with much details here. At the same time, when you go to do your advocacy, it's important that you do not have too many messages. Communication, I want to repeat, is key. If you go with one or two issues, that is enough for you to advocate on for at a particular time. It's also important that you use data. Christine talked about data from the library map of the world. Before, as library advocates, before we go out to do any advocacy program, we should look at the library map of the world, at least that, because you can get data of what is happening in your country, of what is happening in other countries that you can use to strengthen your argument for advocacy. Infographics uh, is another way that you can drive home your point. So it's important that you use these tools which are available to you. Another key element is what change outcomes, outputs do you want from your advocacy? Do you want the policy maker or the community chief to do something specific for you or for the community? What are the mutual benefits? Because when you go to advocate, there must be benefits, say to the community, to the nation, to the library sector, there has to be mutual benefits if you're going to get full attention of your partner. And that takes me to the next point. Collaboration and partnerships are very important. I cannot stress this enough. You must look for champions. You must look for partners who can run with you and take the message that you want to pass across to make that change which you desire. Also, you should conclude your advocacy on a positive note. Do not go to a minister, for instance, and start arguing with him, even if he needs additional data to understand what you are saying, just say to him that you can provide more data. It is not a time to argue. It is not a time to have a fight in quotes about anything or any issue. Just deal with the reason why you are there, deal with your message, leave or conclude on a positive note, exchange contact details, and leave a very brief written document that summarizes what you are advocating for. And uh, the last thing I want to talk about in this regard is how will you measure, monitor, measure uh, the impact of your advocacy? and of course, reporting the advocacy impact assessment and outcomes is very important. These are the key elements as um, that, that I would just mention here. There are so many others. But the last thing I want to talk about today, my third takeaway for the day, is to share my ex uh, personal experience on how in Nigeria, we advocated for the inclusion of school libraries in Nigeria's voluntary national review in 2020. We advocated for the use of school libraries as vehicles for transforming the education sector in Nigeria. And this is my story, very brief. 
In February 2020, Damilare and I and a few other librarians organized a side event at the African Regional Forum for Sustainable Development, uh, supported by IFLA in uh, Victoria Falls in Zimbabwe. The focus of our workshop was on the role of libraries in the attainment of the SDGs. Nigeria was scheduled to have its voluntary national review later that year in July. So the first thing that Milare and I did was to identify Team Nigeria from the Office of the Senior Special Assistant to the President on SDGs. Because we had to know who will take the final decision, who can make that change that we desire. And we went to the team. We then lobbied the team to attend the IFLA side event. Fortunately, even though reluctantly, they attended the event and learned about how libraries in Nigeria and the rest of Africa were engaging with the SDGs. This stimulated their interests. We got their contact details. And when we got back home, as agreed, we contacted them and followed up by answering many of the questions that they raised at the workshop in Zimbabwe. We got an appointment to make a comprehensive presentation to the SDGs office in Nigeria on how Nigerian libraries were already supporting the attainment of the SDGs and how we could do much more if we worked with them together. Our key message was that we wanted to be on the national committee that was preparing the presentation of the voluntary national review document for Nigeria. We were informed at the time we reached them that it was too late for us to join the committee because they had actually rounded up their reports, but that there was a window of opportunity for us to make inputs into the report since they were going to organize the last meeting to clean up the report. Damilari and I were invited to that meeting, the last meeting, and we made a very short intervention on how school libraries can be used as hubs to drive quality education. At the end of that meeting, the stakeholders were convinced and therefore libraries were included as veritable channels for achieving the SDGs in the Nigerian Voluntary National Review document, which was presented in New York in 2020. We have since moved on from there to collaborate with NGOs to demonstrate the key role information plays in the attainment of the SDGs. I am now um, a member of the Consortium of International NGOs in Education in Nigeria and much work and engagement is being done with them. I will conclude my presentation with um, some of my very famous words. I'm sure many of you have heard this many times, that although librarians in Nigeria have not yet arrived in Jerusalem, we have certainly left Egypt. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Mutira Okoje, for this detailed insights and experience sharing uh, from practical experiences of engagement in the Vienna process. And I believe uh, our participant today must have learned a lot on how they could potentially, you know, align and, and apply some of these learnings in country, uh, in their own countries also. So 
we've had presentation about how we can advocate for libraries, stakeholder mapping, and also get to understand documenting library stories, and more importantly, also experience sharing from practical knowledge uh, from, from Dr. Okoji. Uh, at this point, uh, we, we're going to dive into questions and, and, and questions, because I believe that we might have questions we wanna ask to get more clarity and understanding in some, some things. And now we can contextualize some applications of these things to our various regions. So at this point, participants, uh, it's time for question and answers. If you have questions you have that you want us to respond to, so speakers here to also respond to you, uh, we have to, to, to respond now. So feel free to drop in your questions in the Q&A session or in the chat box, and we're happy to respond to your questions. So while we wait for colleagues to drop in questions in the chat box in the Q&A session, uh, this is a session for, for us, the Encontrary Biblical Code Design Team. Now to learn from this experience that has been shared, as we go on to work on our in-country advocacy plan going forward, uh, to understand the approaches to use, the key indicator of success, and how you can develop a clear logic model to, to drive progress uh, for libraries in the various countries. Okay, so if there are no questions, uh, we're able to uh, proceed. I can see there are comments in the chat box we have here uh, from, from Siki, which says motivating and inspiring, good presentation. Thank you so much for that. I can see also from Dr. Ayodele Alonga says, thanks, this is expository and informative. Thank you all speakers, thank you so much. So it appears that we have an in-depth understanding of the concept we've discussed today, and not just that, its applicability uh, to situations in our various countries, and need for us to go back now as we progressively move forward uh, to apply these principles, these practical experiences that I've been shared with us by our speakers here uh, in this session. So we're still gonna wait for the next couple of seconds to know if we have questions or clarifications we wanna get better. Sure, I can see uh, a question here on the chat box, which says, please, will the recording be made available? Of course, yes. Uh, we'll make the recording available uh, afterwards for you to watch again, because this is a virtual workshop. So there's some lessons you might want to go back to, you might want to go back to, uh, to learn from, and we believe we're gonna share you the recording of the workshop so that you can also refer back and watch with your colleagues in country. And um, yeah, so um, questions, questions, questions uh, that we might have, or for the clarity you want, our speakers to further, you know, provide uh, for you before we end today's session. Okay, I can see uh, a question from Sifian from Botswana, if I'm correct, says that, are we going to get a format for reporting or are we going to design our own format? So now in this context that appears, are we going to get uh, a format for reporting uh, library impact on stories? Okay, um, Christine, uh, are there formats you want to propose our in-country library team work use or what do you advise in this trajectory? Thank you for the question. If the question was about the stories, uh, yes, there is a format and uh, there are uh, two ways how you can submit a story. We have an online, well, not a story, how you can submit an information for an SDG story. Uh, because before, uh, well, when you will uh, submit an information, uh, we will curate the story. Important thing to mention is that you don't have to write the story uh, yourself, but we will write it for you uh, based on the information that uh, we will receive. And there are two ways how you can submit uh, information for the story. Uh, one is the online submission form and I will share the link in the chat uh, after I finish. And another way is to contact the library map uh, team directly uh, through email. 
uh, saying that you want to submit and we can provide the word version of the same form. So basically you need to provide information about the context uh, that I meant talk is about the why, uh, about the community, the target group, and what the problem is. Uh, information about the project, uh, also including some statistics to understand the scale. Is it a small project or a big national program? Uh, and the impact, uh, which should contain some evidence, uh, can come from the survey data or a testimonial. Uh, that would be all three parts. And then because there is a big focus also on partnerships in the sustainable development, the separate section where we asked for information is if there were any partners or it's just a library and uh, and how this uh, was all implemented. And then you can attach images uh, or videos, uh, links to videos. Uh, because there is a requirement to have one visual element for the story when it goes on the map and links to any additional information that might be useful and you can add documents such as your own internal reports containing information and when we receive all of this uh, we then review if that meets the requirements we have and what additional information we might need or it's enough uh, for the story. So I'll post the link uh, to the submission form now in the chat uh, and uh, I can follow up the Melari with you to also share the board template uh, for those stories and then we can see how we can work together to get more stories for advocacy. <laughs> I hope this is helpful. <laughs> I see that there is another question. Uh, yeah, Damilari, you are muted. Then, yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> so sorry. Thank you so much, Christine. Uh, yeah. So I can see this in that question in the chat box. It says, um, some libraries have amazing impact stories, but are afraid of doing so. I mean, in doing so means sharing, if I'm correct. Right. So what do you advise, Christine? Yeah. Okay. So first thing I should, should advise is uh, don't be scared. <laughs> <laughs> we are, you know, normal people here <laughs> talk. But as I said, uh, we every story is a learning experience. And this curation process where we talk, talk together, we want to be, you know, as inclusive as possible and uh, take from the, where, we, where we are. But uh, another thing I want to mention is that if there are smaller libraries which are shy to contact an international organization like IFLA, uh, you know, that seems so very far away, uh, we do work with what we call mediators. Uh, some bigger institutions, bigger libraries or bigger associations uh, in the country uh, who, who mediate between the library map team and the uh, small library. Uh, and that, uh, in most cases, is uh, is for the language barrier, but it can also be for other reasons. And and then the someone else on behalf uh, can submit also the story. That's why I would like to invite first not to be scared. Uh, we do work with really small libraries as well for the stories uh, and uh, bigger libraries and uh, never be ashamed of the impact that you are making. Even it might, uh, you know, feel like, um, <laughs> like nothing special for you, but actually it's a big thing that, uh, that everybody is doing for, for the sake of communities. So I hope to be in touch <laughs> with all of them. Yeah, brilliant, amazing. Thank you so much, Christine, for these insightful responses. And I think that will be the last of questions we'll be taking today. So colleagues on the in-country advocacy co-design team will be working with you closely as we go on uh, to craft your advocacy plan and also to work on your plan for communicating your impact. So we're going to continue to engage going forward as we progress on this. And um, I just want to take one or two comments to see in the chat box, which says, uh, I know if so we share the presentation uh, definitely after this conversation. We you receive an email with the presentation. And uh, thank you so much, everyone, for joining. As we round up uh, this session today, I'm going to invite again uh, Dr. Sarah Arcadu to give us uh, a closing remarks for today's session. Dr. Sarah, over to you. Uh, thank you so much, Damilari. Uh, thank you so much, our dear facilitators. 
uh, for sharing your wealth of experience, your knowledge uh, that has, you must have seen from the responses in the, in the chat, they are all praises. I love this. And um, if I were in class, I would say, can I see by show of a hand who is going to take this further? And of course, who are quoting one of the pre uh, presenter's words, are leaving um, Egypt and, and maybe about to arrive in Jerusalem. I'm sure many of you would start, would get started and wait to arrive. So this energy, I, I, would, I would request we continue until we see libraries appear on the SDGs agenda. Libraries make an impact. Together we can make this happen. I'm, I want to make a call to colleagues who are coming from countries uh, that we are not represented uh, when the survey was going around. Please feel free, even if you are not aware whether your country got participants or not, just uh, feel free to come to our inbox and say, I want to be part of this. Uh, you are very, very welcome. And we shall have you on board and more sessions will be organized for you to ensure you're on the same page. Um, with that, I want to say a very good uh, afternoon to most of us or evening to most of us and enjoy the rest of the day. Bye-bye. Uh, Thank you so much. Bye for now. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.